Hello there and welcome back to another video here on Wrist Watch Revival. My name is Marshall. Thank you so much for coming along. This time I've got a Seiko Week Dater. This one comes from the late 60s. I got it off of eBay for a little over a hundred bucks and uh, I really like the dial. It's gray but it's got some kind of bluish tones to it and uh, this thing was listed as not running properly. Um, apparently it would run for a little bit but then stop. So we're going to give it a service and see if we can't get it running well. And uh, maybe we can transform this watch into a cool little, uh, you know, weekend summer watch. First things first, of course, we need to get into the movement. And the movement, by the way, is a nice one. It's an 8306A from Seiko. And this is actually a 30 joule movement. Jewels, of course, are the synthetic rubies that act as bearings, which you can see there. And uh, they use them on pretty much every bearing surface uh, for the most part. Uh, in the watch, it's actually a really nice movement. Um, so that's actually a bonus here as well. Of course, in order for us to get the uh, movement out of the case, we have to take out the winding stem. This is an automatic movement, as you can see from the, uh, from the rotor that was spinning around there. That, of course, means that it, it winds itself. You don't actually have to wind up the watch on the side. If you've ever heard that term automatic or manual wind or whatever. People call uh, movements different types, but you know, broadly speaking, there's two different types of movement. There's quartz and there's mechanical. This of course is a mechanical. And within that, there's two uh, categories as well. One of them is automatic or self-winding, which is what we have here. And that uses the weight from a rotor or some other type of piece of metal basically to rotate and wind up the watch when you just move your hand. And then a manual wind watch is, is exactly what you think. You just have to turn the crown to wind it up. But again, this one's a little bit more sporty and uh, a lot of times sports watches are automatics. First things first, as far as the uh, disassembly goes here, we need to take off that automatic winding rotor. That's it right there. When that thing flops around, when you wave at somebody, go for a walk, when you're typing on your computer, it, uh, it spins and it winds the watch up just a little tiny bit at a time for each spin, but those add up pretty quickly. And before you know it, your watch is all wound up. One of the cool parts about automatics, of course, is that if you, if you wear them, you know, basically every day, you never have to wind them. So we can take this movement ring off as we continue to get into this movement. It also, of course, is it's called a week dater because it has the the date as well as the day listed on the dial. Speaking of the dial, we need to take the dial off. So let's get the, uh, let's get the dial off of here. The dial really caught my eye. It's kind of an interesting one. Again, it's this, uh, it's gray, but it has some, some blue tones in it. A little bit of iridescent. It's actually a really pretty dial. It's held up very well over the years. And you can see it there. Yeah, really nice in the sun. Okay, so now we can take the, uh, the day disc off as we start to work our way through. We're going to, we're going to give this watch a full service, a service in terms of watches means completely disassembling it, cleaning it thoroughly, and then reassembling it with proper lubrication as well. That'll solve a lot of problems with older watches. Not all of them though. All right, Canon pinion comes off. I get to use my nifty Canon pinion removal tool. I got that off of eBay a while back and uh, kind of cleaned it up, refurbished it, and it's been a great tool. There's a plastic ring here. That's just a dial support. It doesn't actually do anything other than just give the dial something to lean up against around the edge of the movement. And the first thing that we're going to want to do here is take off the balance. We'll put it back on before we put the movement into the watch cleaning machine. We do want to clean the balance. It is in fact quite important that you clean the balance. But what we don't want to do is just throw it in a basket with the other parts. And, and mainly that's because of the balance spring, also known as the hairspring. It is an extremely thin spring and you can ruin it very, very easily. 
And if it were to be put in one of the watch cleaning machine baskets and spun around, it would almost for sure just get uh, torn apart. So we'll set the balance aside for now so that we can continue to uh, take apart the watch. Can start by looking at this uh, bigger plate. And I can also take off the uh, the case screws. These are just, uh, they just screw into those little metal flaps right there and they hold the, uh, the movement ring in place. So we'll get those out of the way while we're here. Now, I also wanna let down the mainspring and, and that's just because if it's wound up at all, you don't want it to uh, all of a sudden unwind all at once, which, which can happen. So I'm gonna put the, the winding stem back in and then I can just move the click out of the way and then just gently let go. But as it turns out, the watch doesn't really have any wind in it anyway. So well, it's just being safe. Before we continue though, I wanna to start to take apart the other side here so that I can make sure that everything comes apart properly. And this is the calendar side of the movement. And as you can see, there's a couple of plates that are holding this calendar in place, the calendar ring in place. They also hold various springs and such underneath them. So we'll get those out of the way and kind of sort out what we wanna do from here. I've never worked on this movement before. Uh, I find myself in this position all the time. The first time working on a movement is always a little bit, uh, well, there's some usually some bumps in the road and then you don't make those mistakes again. So there's a spring here on the, uh, on the jumper that I want to remove, but I wanna be careful with it. Unfortunately, it kind of jumped there. But I got the spring, no problem. It just, uh, it just went onto the bench. You can see there's a jumper here for the date, the day disc as well, but it's, uh, it's screwed down. So I'll need to uh, take that out. This screw is kind of interesting. It's, it's a screw, but it's also a post so that that jumper can move back and forth. And we'll take that off now. Okay, so we're kind of working our way through the calendar pretty well here. As you can see, there's another cover plate, but this one is also screwed down. And we can take that cover plate off. The hour wheel is still obstructed. This time it's by the quick set mechanism for the date. So we'll need to get that out of the way as well. <laughs> I mean, we're gonna take all this apart anyway, right? So me as well. And there it is, it comes off pretty easily. There is a spring as well that actuates on that. So we'll need to make sure that that comes out without jumping across the room. There we go. And this wheel um, is actually the wheel that moves over the calendar when the watch is running at a normal, as normal. When you're not setting the calendar, but the watch is just running, once every 24 hours, right, the, the new day should arrive. And this is the mechanism that does that. It just couples to the uh, motion works. It's actually a fairly simple device. And it's geared so that instead of going around once every 12 hours, like the hour wheel, it goes around once every 24. And when it does, it has a little, little knob that just bumps over the date disc and that's it. Okay, now we can get to the uh, keyless works here. And that's the setting lever spring, which also acts as a kind of a cover plate for right here. which is the yoke spring attached to the yoke, or not attached, but pushing on the yoke, I should say. Again, just wanna be careful that the spring doesn't jump off on you. They, uh, they can be hard to find. 
And there's the yolk coming out now. Now I'm going to turn the movement over here and we can start to focus once again on the uh, on the other side. And uh, I can remove this small bridge on the side here, which is holds into place the uh, the automatic winding works. Again, this is this is the, these are the gears whose responsibility it is to take that rotor winding action, that spinning of the rotor, and turn it into what are ultimately little tiny winds on the mainspring, as if you took the the crown on your watch and just turned it like a quarter of a turn or half of a turn, but they add up really quickly. So we can take that part apart now. And now we can get into this main plate that kind of covers a lot of different jewels here. You can see the center wheels there, the barrel bridge, one of the automatic winding works, the third wheel, the fourth wheel. And with that off, now we can take a look at the barrel that has the ratchet wheel on top of it. <clears throat> and this is the trainer wheels here that I was just talking about. So those come out pretty easily now, all the way down to the escape wheel, which is the that one on the end with the kind of funny looking teeth. Now there seems to be another kind of a central bridge going over the center wheel. There's also the click, which is in the way. We'll take that off. The click on uh, these Seiko movements is, it's genius. It's its its uh, engineering genius. That's it right there. That little piece of metal. That, that little piece of metal is, is <laughs> it does everything that the click needs to do. It really is a, a fantastic little piece of design. And there's the barrel coming out. And that's an intermediate wheel again for the winding of the barrel. And that leaves this last little kind of bridge thing over the center wheel, and we can take that off now. This also encapsulates the part of the movement that makes it so that there's a center seconds hand. Center seconds, of course, is when the seconds hand is mounted on the same post that the hour and minutes has in the middle of the watch. Older watches had the seconds hand mounted elsewhere in its own spot. All right, so there's that middle bridge coming out and then the last wheel in place is just that center wheel sitting there. Okay. So we are getting right through this movement. I will say if you ever wanna take up this hobby, I know some of you um, are wanting to do that as well. Uh, and some of you, you know, just love watches. And then there's even some of you that watch that are like, I don't even really like watches. I just like seeing how this goes. And you're all welcome here. <laughs> this is uh, th this hobby. You don't have to even own a watch to enjoy it. But if you do want to get into the actual repair part of it, this is the easy part. Taking the watch apart um, is quite easy. <laughs> you will find that putting it back together <laughs> is much, much more complicated than uh, taking it apart. But I encourage people to try taking a watch apart anyway. And even if you don't get it back together, uh, you still learn a lot. Uh, the first watch that I ever worked on, I took apart and I never put back together because I didn't know how. But I still felt like I learned a lot. Okay, the keyless works comes apart. And that means that the sliding clutch and the clutch wheel are just free to uh, come out of the movement. And there we go. A nice little pile of parts. And now, of course, I can put back on the balance, as I mentioned before. This will go back on before the watch goes into the watch cleaning machine. And as I do this, I'd like to remind you that if you like what I'm doing here on the channel, you can support me via Patreon. I've actually got it all set up where you get a thank you card in the mail. And I'd like to uh, give a special thank you to Trevor, Seth, Robert, Mitchell, Mikey, Kevin, James, George, Erica, Dustin, Brinton, Brian, Brett, Alex, and Brad. Thanks for the support, I really appreciate it. Okay, so now that we've got that back on, there's only one thing left to do, which is to take the mainspring out of the barrel 
to make sure that it gets cleaned as well. The barrels on these older Seikos are a little bit different than the, the Swiss ones that we normally work on on the channel, but they're basically the same setup. There's a cap, there's a barrel, there's an arbor, and there's a spring. It's the same idea. So we'll get this uh, rather dirty, crusty spring out of here. See what kind of condition the spring's in and if it needs to be replaced. All right, here comes, whoop. <laughs> Uh, be careful with the springs, uh, but this one actually looks like it's in pretty good shape. It's just dirty. Now let's focus our attention here on the dial. This dial, like I said, is really pretty. Uh, seriously, it's held up really well. And look at that beautiful sheen and the sunburst effect that it has on it. It's really nice. But here's something that I found out when I was looking at it. This is bizarre. Look at this. That is loom. There is, that's the glow in the dark stuff on a dial, but it's in the indices facing outwards. And look at this. When I looked at the hands, that loom is on the bottom of the hands, not the top. The hands just look like metal when they're actually on the watch. There is loom on the bottom of the hands. And I cannot for the life of me figure out what they were trying to do with this, but I do have a hunch. And we're going to put that hunch to the test later on when we actually get this watch together. I think that they wanted the loom to reflect downwards off of the hands and onto the dial itself. And I think that they wanted the loom on the dial itself to reflect outwards onto like a, some type of reflective surface. And we're gonna take a look at that because that is a wild setup for the loom. Like seriously, not what you would expect to see. So with the loom taken off of the hands, now we have to take it out of each one of these indices. And as you can see, it's kind of finicky work. I have to really get in there, but I'm wondering how much loom do they put in? And there we go. I can actually get the loom out. Not bad with my tweezers. I just have to be really careful. And of course, I don't want to scratch the dial. But check that out. It comes out. So I'm going to take all of the loom out of each one of those plots. And now I can mix up some new loom. And we'll replace it. And I honestly don't know what to expect. You know, the design flaw, of course, with this is that the loom, the way it's set up on the outside of the indices and on the underside of the hands, it means it never sees direct light. And that's what you kind of need to charge up loom. So I'm a little skeptical about whether that will actually work or not, but let's try it. So we mix up the loom using the loom powder and the binder, as you saw mix it up thoroughly and get it to the right consistency. What is the right consistency? Well, it takes a little while before you kind of feel it out. It needs to be able to flow enough so that there's a, a capillary action, but it can't be too runny where it actually runs off the side of the part that you're doing it on. So take a look here. I'm gonna carefully put more loom on the bottom of the hands and that consistency is perfect. It doesn't run off the side of the hand, but as I drag it across, it does fill in the gaps naturally. If it's too thick, it won't do that. Also, if you've never seen a, a hand get loomed before, that may look like too much to you. You might be going, whoa, you're laying it on a little thick there, bud. But you actually have to do it that way. Um, when it dries, all of the liquid, of course, is gone and it leaves just a layer of that compound, the luminous compound that's left over. And uh, that actually shrinks down a lot, like to the point that you could even put another layer of loom on something like this if you really wanted and it would be okay. Okay, so there's the hands and now the tricky business of getting the loom into these little hips here, again, on the outer edge of the dial. I'm nervous that the loom doesn't want to go in, but all right, I guess it does want to go in. <laughs> so this seems like it was actually fairly well designed in that uh, there's enough of a, a gap there where the capillary action will pull the loom in to the index. Wild design on these indexes. I, I think it's really cool though. And there we go. So with that done, we can set it aside to let it dry and we can start the reassembly of the watch and the movement. First thing, of course, is the mainspring going in. I also put some braking grease around the inside of the barrel here, and that's for automatic movements because when the watch gets fully wound, remember, it gets wound just from you moving around. 
the uh, the mainspring actually will slide along the inside of the barrel a little bit, and you don't want there to be no lubrication, or else it's just metal on metal. So we'll get this uh, this mainspring barrel back together, and now we can start going on this movement. Really curious to see how well this thing runs, or if it runs. Can put the mainspring in, or the, the barrel in, excuse me. And I'll go ahead and put the click in place as well. And I'll put the ratchet wheel in. And just make sure that things are kind of lining up here, at least roughly speaking. And get the click put into place. And now I can start on the train of wheels. Can start with the escape wheel. But I'm like, wait a second. If I'm gonna start with the escape wheel, that means I gotta go back to the center wheel, but it's not in place yet. <laughs> so we'll put the center wheel in place first. So I have to do a little bit of undoing, but not super bad. Okay, now we can get kicking again on the rest, here comes that middle bridge. And we'll get that screwed down. And we can now address the rest of the train of wheels. These are what take the relatively slow unwinding of the mainspring barrel and transfer them into the very, very fast spinning of the escape wheel. Each time there's a geared wheel exchange there, the ratio is being changed. And over five wheels, effectively, that ratio changes a lot. Okay, so now we can go for this uh, the main plate and put that back on. Oh, it looks like things actually got lined up pretty pretty well here. If you push the mainspring barrel around, you should see the uh, the escape wheel go, and that does seem to be the case. Yeah, there it goes. All right, so we're in business. Can turn our attention now to the calendar side of things. I'm gonna go ahead and put the cannon pinion on here first. Just use a sturdy pair of tweezers to gently click it into place. And now I can get the keyless works going. This is the, uh, the clutch wheel, which will go right here. And then I can grab the sliding clutch as well. That blue grease that I'm using is the most, it's the thickest of the lubricants. And it's meant to handle the most kind of metal on metal, heaviest duty stuff in the watch. And that happens over here in the keyless works. You wouldn't wanna use grease like that on the more finer parts because it can actually slow them down. It's, it's too much. So now I can put some more of it on the, uh, on the stem here before I put that into place. And there we go. Now the setting lever. The setting lever on this watch isn't the traditional kind that has a screw on it. Instead, it's more of a uh, spring-loaded type. That's the spring right there, actually. And it works pretty well. So we'll get this screw down. And just make sure really quickly that the motion's correct and it looks good. 
And you can take a look-see here as I lubricate that sliding clutch because the part I'm about to put in here, the uh, the, yoke sp the yoke here, it actually is just metal on metal sliding up against that right there once it gets in the groove. So you can see why we need to put that heavier duty grease and things like that. Yoke spring going in now. This is uh, one of the, traditionally one of the beefier springs in a watch movement. It pushes pretty hard on that yoke. And now we can put the setting lever spring again, which acts as two purposes. It's a cover plate for the yoke and the yoke spring so that it stays in place. But it's also the, uh, the spring for the setting levers. You can see it kind of gives it grooves to go in for the three different handset positions. Now, as we continue along the calendar side here, we can get the quick set date mechanism put into place. This is a little bit tricky because the spring has to kind of fit in a tight spot, but there we go. And there's a little cover plate here that keeps the spring and the mechanism in place. All right. So we got that in place. And once again, another cover plate as we work our way through. Good. And this once again is the jumper for the day disc. with its special screw that's actually a post so that it can still do this, go back and forth. Okay, so everything's in place there. And now we can uh, once again, move our attention over to the other side of the calendar works with this calendar wheel, I guess you'd call it. I don't know what it's called, but uh, again, this is the wheel that when the movement goes around after 24 hours, it'll actually turn the, uh, the calendar over. There's just a little intermediate wheel for that that goes off of the, uh, the hour wheel. And again, it's really simple. It just simply gears the ratio so that instead of every 12 hours, which is how often the hour wheel goes around, uh, does it every 24. Now we can oil the jewels on the top and the bottom of the movement. And that of course, in movements like this with all these extra jewels means these little tiny shock absorbing things. And these are really good. I mean, they make it so that the movements really quite impervious to shock, but they are so finicky and tiny and they just fly away like that. Sometimes I got lucky and found that one. As you can see, putting the cap jewel back on, you want to see that circle of oil right in the middle. And when I put this back on, I'm going to be a little more careful using one of my sticks here to make sure that that spring doesn't go flying and get it into place. There we go. That's what you want to see. So that's perfect. That one's good to go. And I want to show you one that isn't. So look what happens here. As I put this on, you can see there's a bubble of air underneath and it actually surrounds where the oil is supposed to be. That needs to be redone. The whole point of that capsule is to suspend a bit of oil right above just like that. That's what it's supposed to look like. So with that done, we've got all the, the non-balanced jewels oiled. We can continue with the reassembly. This again is part of the automatic winding works that I'm putting back together now. That's a reversing wheel. That way when the rotor spins one direction or the other direction, it still winds the watch. The earlier forms of automatic movements with these, uh, with these rotors would only actually go when you turn them in one direction or when they spun in one direction, I should say. But these ones um, will wind the watch whether it's spinning uh, clockwise or counterclockwise. All right, so this looks about right. Now I can put the pallet fork in. as well as the pallet fork bridge. Mm -hmm. 
the screws that you use um, for the pallet fork bridge are actually special ones. They have a very flat top so that they sit completely flush with that bridge. And the reason for that is the balance wheel goes right on top of that. And if you use regular screws, then they stick out, it'll hit it. I've, done, I've had that happen before where the screw actually fit, but it didn't work. Just a quick check of the pallet fork to make sure that there's power getting to it. And it looks like there is, not a ton, but it looks like it's good to go. So that means we can put the balance in this thing and see if we can't get it running. This, of course, is always a huge moment <laughs> when you're working on a watch. It was vaguely running before, so I do kind of expect it to, to kick back up, but you never know. All right, now I haven't actually tightened down the balance yet. That's why you can see it moving around. I just have the screw ready there. Let's see if I can get it to start, though, before I do screw it down all the way. No, not like that. Th there we go. We got it. So now this watch is running again. That's a great first step and I can use the crown here to put a wind in it. You don't, this watch can be wound up if you'd like, but of course it does it on its own. And that's a beautiful thing to see. Now, of course, before we uh, figure out how it's gonna do on the time grapher, we have a few more cap jewels to do. And that means that getting these dia shock uh, springs off, and that's what these are called, the Seiko ones. And I'm not really used to working on these. And one of them just flew away. And very, very, very sadly, I did not find it. That doesn't happen very often, but I did not find that and I actually had to order another one. The good news is I was able to find another one pretty easily and here it is a week and a half later. So this is part of the pain of being a watch repairer is that you will occasionally lose a part. Hopefully it gets fewer and fewer. Usually these are actually pretty easy to find I could not, I looked for like an hour and a half and it was just gone, super bummed about it because it stops the whole project in its tracks, but I'm lucky that it's not an expensive part and that it's not one that's particularly difficult to find. So with the new one, is this gonna work now? Yes, yes please, make sure that it's all in there, there we go, that's what we wanna see. And let's put it on the time grapher and see how it does. Very nice. About minus three, minus five seconds, zero beat error, 240 degrees of amplitude. That's fantastic. I'll do a wear test on it after it's done too to make sure that it keeps running because that was one of the reported problems. But I am really happy with that. So now we can turn our attention back here to the calendar side where I can put on the calendar jumper, the calendar jumper spring and the calendar ring itself. So there we go, that just provides pressure so that it clicks over. And now we can get these two plates, these cover plates back on. And we are right and truly down the stretch here on this uh, little project. Again, I really love these, uh, I mean, a little over a hundred bucks. And if I can get this thing running well, you've got a cool vintage watch. It's got a nice kind of, like I said, weekend summer type vibe. And it's got a really high quality movement in it too. So I'm, I'm getting excited about this one. Okay, so this other cover plate needs to go on and then, well, that's a little weird, right? That jumper, it's just kind of flopping around. I don't really know what's up with that. So we'll just put the, the day disc in and see what it does. Doesn't seem to be engaging particularly, and I don't know why. It really seems to be that there's no jumper spring there. And I'll tell you, when I don't know what to do, I look it up online. I look at other YouTubers, I go to forums, I'll do whatever I can to try to figure out what's going on with that. And one of the places that I go for Seiko is my friend Mike over at My Retro Watches. Let's see what he has to say. I'll just show you what I've got to do. So this little thing here, and this tiny spring, I have to go in, I have to squash that into that little recess, and then flip it over. In case you can't see, my tweezers are shaking because that's the <laughs> the nerves. 
And thanks, Mike. Again, that's Mike from My Retro Watches here on YouTube. He does Seikos and a bunch of other types of restorations, and I'll have a link to his channel in the in the description below. I needed to know what the heck happened here. Obviously, there's a spring missing. You can see it in Mike's video, and I don't have it on my movement here. So what I've done is I've rewound to when I was taking apart the movement, and I figured it out. So watch this. See if you can see it when it goes. Gone. That's it. If you didn't see it, let's do it again in slow motion. So take a look, that spring right there, that's the one that's going across, and watch this. Boop. Gone. Just like that. I didn't even see it when it happened. You can see the spring's now gone. And that's all it takes to lose a spring on something like this. I didn't even know it when it happened. So I get to send away for another one. And now that we're back in real time, here it is. It has arrived. <laughs> it is in this bag. You can barely see it. <laughs> it's in there. It's such a small spring. There it is right there. But now we can once again get underway with the project. So so far, I am uh, two springs down, and they're both self-inflicted wounds, not something I'm particularly proud of, but I also want to show you what it's really like to work on watches here on the channel, and this is, at least uh, as far as my experience goes, part of the deal. You do occasionally lose a part, although it is rare, I'm kind of piling them up here on this one. So just like Mike did on his channel, I need to get this little spring on the underside of the cover plate and then that will push on that day jumper and uh, and then we'll be ready to go again. So this is very tricky business as, as, uh, as we saw. But there we go. So we got that sorted and now we can once again move forward with the reassembly. As you can see now, you can see that spring sticking out on the bottom. And so what I think I'm gonna do is just get the plate in place with the spring in situ and then I will just sort of have it where it's going to sit and then once I get it tacked down, then I can just move the spring behind the jumper. There we go. And that is what was missing before and why the day disc was not working properly. Whew. Finally, we get to move forward again with the project. These, uh, these little mistakes, they add up the money and they add up the time. But again, you know, this is a, a fun side project thing uh, from eBay, so can deal with it. All right, so we can put the hour in, wheel in place now. And this, once again, is the plastic ring that the dial kind of sits on. That just, sits, that just gets pressed into place. And now, here's the day disc. And this is actually pretty cool, too. There's this big hole there, and that hole is actually so that you can move the jumper out of the way. So another nice design there from our friends at Seiko. Thank you, friends at Seiko, for making my life easier by putting that hole in. And then there you go. The day disc just sits right into place, and we can move forward with getting the dial reinstalled as well. So there we go. Can use the blower just to make sure that there's no little bits of debris or dust on there. And we'll make sure that the dial is screwed down properly. And of course that the calendar works can work. Um, you know, there's a chance that the dial can get in the way. We're also setting this for exactly midnight so that I can put the hands on. So right there as the, as the calendar clicks over from one day to the next, that is exactly midnight, right? I mean, it makes sense. And so that's why I know, that's how I know where to put the, the hands uh, to be at midnight. Now on a watch that doesn't have a calendar, you don't have to do that because midnight is, you know, the same. At, it's it's twelve. <laughs> it, there's no differentiation. But on a um, on a calendar watch, there is noon and midnight are two different times on a calendar watch. Okay, just making sure that the hour hand's not bumping into each other and is all lined up so that I can get the minute hand put on. Again, there's loom on the bottom of these hands. We're still <laughs> we're going to see how that goes a little bit later and bingo looking good with the hands one more to go of course the second hand needs to go on now I just want to make sure that we get it started before we gently push it into place with the hand press tool 
There we go. And then again, just a quick check to make sure that the hands are functioning properly and that nothing's hitting or banging or getting out of alignment or anything like that. Now we can turn our attention to the case and the crystal. And I can't get this crystal out of here, even with really firm thumb pressure. So I'm assuming that this is a tension fit crystal ring. A tension fit crystal ring actually has a piece of metal at the bottom, uh, a ring of metal at the bottom that pushes out against the case and makes it waterproof or more waterproof. The regular crystals don't have that metal tension ring. They just fit in with friction. So you often can't push them out with your thumbs. And so you need to use the crystal press to actually remove crystals like this. So that's what I'm gonna do. It makes sense. The watch says waterproof on the back, which they don't use that term much anymore because um, it actually has like more meaning. But, um, but you know, they, I wouldn't be surprised if they use a tension crystal ring on this. A lot of dive watches have that. So all we have to do is just fit one so that it'll ugh, come out like that and it should just pop out and then I can get a new tension fit crystal ring or just clean this one up while I, after I clean the case, put it in the ultrasonic. Uh-oh. Wait, something's not right here though. The, the front of the crystal seems to have come off, but it broke? Yeah, it's actually broken. Look, you can see chunks of the crystal still sitting within the case, and it looks like the tension ring is still in there too. And I'm gonna have to try to get this out of here. And I don't really know how. So my first instinct <laughs> was to grab some pliers and to try to pry out that crystal ring. And I did that, and it didn't come out. And then I took a closer look, and I realized that there's a bezel, a removable metal bezel on the front of this watch and I'm just feeling so so stupid now because I went in there with the pliers and you can see the rest of that was just stuck underneath so do you see what I did that's what I did I banged up that inner bezel and here's the problem that inner bezel you can see it that is not that that is like a part that when you look at the watch dial it's around the edge so now I have to repair it. So I'm gonna get my files out and my sandpaper and I'm gonna to go to town on this thing and try to get it back to, uh, to shiny again. But call it third self-inflicted wound of the project. So I'm having a real banner, <laughs> banner run at this thing. But hey, once again, you gotta learn, right? So off we go. And after a lot of sanding, a lot of filing and getting this thing, to try to get this thing as close to back to normal, as possible, this is what I came up with. Pretty good, actually. Uh, you know, there's still a couple of little dings on the thing that I'm not gonna be able to get out, but for the most part, it is indistinguishable from the rest. So, okay, so it cost me an extra hour and a half, but I was able to get it pretty close to back to uh, factory there. Now I've got uh, a new Seiko crystal that I had to order and wait another two weeks for. <laughs> it's been a, a real... Uh, grind of a project, but let's get this uh, new crystal fitted. So I'm going to put it on the case first. And by the way, yes, the case has been through the ultrasonic cleaner in the in the meantime. I had a lot of time to do that. And now I can put this bezel back on. I want to see if it'll just press into place, but it won't. The crystal, uh, which is a Seiko original crystal for this move or for this case, um, it still requires uh, some more pushing. So once again, we're going to go back to the rober press you know, cause it went so well last time. And, uh, and we're gonna press this bezel into place, theoretically. <laughs> Hopefully, pray for me. Now I wanna make sure that this is as lined up as best as I possibly can because I don't wanna put the pressure on the crystal itself. I want as much of the pressure to be on the outer bezel as I can so that it will snap into place and not damage or crack the crystal, of which I only ordered one and I wish I would have ordered another now just in case. But at any rate, we did it. Ha ha, <laughs> we have the watch back together and uh, the bezel's in place, the crystal's on there and we actually freaking made it work. So now we can really get the home stretch done here and let's get this thing cased up and see how it looks. The weekends in the summer can't come soon enough, right? <laughs> so we'll see if we can uh, get this thing rolling. It's already looking pretty good just uh, with the case loosely fitted. Put the movement ring in, get everything lined up. Now we can put the winding stem back in. K 
case clamps, a little quick cleanup with the Rodico. And the last thing to do is to put on the automatic rotor. We'll also make sure that it works before we uh, seal this thing up. So tighten it down. And then what we need to do is just move it around and you can actually see if it's winding. Now, take a look at this. If you look, you can actually see the click going over. Watch this. See how it winds it? Little bit, little bit, little bit, and there we go. That's exactly what you wanna see. And that means that the uh, automatic works is working properly. A new gasket for the back as well, just to give it the best chance to be waterproof. For these vintage watches, I don't recommend taking them like into the ocean or at the bottom of the pool, but I do try at least to give them the best water sealing that I can just to prevent any little accidents or anything like that. So last thing to do is to put the, uh, the case back on and then we can take a look at the finished product. And there it is in all of its glory. It looks great. It's, it's been through the ringer thanks to me, but uh, all in all, it came out beautiful and kind of exactly what I hoped it would be. Uh, I'm really excited about this one. Uh, a really nice, again, this is the sweet spot, right? This watch was is really cool and it was only like a hundred bucks off of eBay. Yeah, I had to put a little extra into it to get it running, but say for under 200, you've got a really nice little weekend watch. Now, I'm not gonna leave you hanging. Yes, of course I tested it to see what the loom did. Let's take a look. I, I can't believe it. It's actually working. You can see the outer uh, loom is being reflected by that inner bezel ring, the one I had to polish. And look at the hands. They're actually glowing down onto the dial and you can see it. I, <laughs> I'm shocked it actually worked. Really cool. And uh, again, what a fun project to work on. Thank you so much for coming along with me. I really appreciate you taking the time to hang out and I always look forward to it. Uh, if you wanna see a little extra content, well, you can go over to Instagram. Instagram account is wristwatch underscore revival and I'll post some in-between project updates and that kind of thing. And once again, if you wanna support the channel, you can do so via Patreon where you get a thank you card and a sticker in the mail and uh, no matter what level you're at, and you get access to some cool features that you don't get here on YouTube. Thanks again for hanging out. We'll see you next time.